Our guest on Yakety Yak tonight is Daniel Petrie. He will, I know, ne know, need no introduction as a social entrepreneur in the area of communications and information technology. Initially, I suppose most of us would have known him as Vice President of Microsoft and then as the founder of eCore. Increasingly, of course, he and his family are known for their philanthropic endeavours. But best of all tonight, our guest Daniel Petrie is provocative. He provokes. I remember in the end of the 1990s reading his book, Father Time, on the necessity of work-life balance. And I have seen him increasingly in recent years arguing the need for high net worth Australians to embrace far more than they do the giving culture. To interview Daniel tonight, as always, Peter Thompson. Please welcome Daniel and Peter to talk to us. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to you, Daniel. Thank you, Peter. Really, um, if you were to sum up Daniel's life... You know, that's far. Well. That's far. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's because... I don't know what you mean. I had a health test last week. I'm OK at the moment. So, <laughs> so. The early part of your life, um, it would be a life of transformations. And it strikes me that your parents also went through a life of transformation. They, were, they came to Australia post-war. Just, just explain how that came about. Uh, so my, my parents were uh, living in Europe. My uh, parents were both born in Romania, although my, my mother was of Austrian descent. Uh, in the war, my mother was moved as a child uh, from Romania back to Austria uh, in, the, uh, in the trains. And in fact, she tells a story about how they were at a, a railway station and uh, they saw the carriages full of um, Jewish citizens being taken, open carriages in the middle of the winter, to um, concentration camps and how that impacted her as a child. And she, to this day, is quite traumatised by that. And then my father was uh, studying at university, doing a PhD in, in philosophy. The war came and he decided to join the underground, uh, was captured and then he was liberated at, at a uh, concentration camp, or more a, a prisoner of war camp for political prisoners. And so then post-war they had no country to go to because Romania was taken over by the Russians. So they were this nice term of displaced persons and uh, they were then shipped and you were shipped to either Canada, the US or Australia and sort of this was a roundabout and they were shipped to Australia. I know your dad's only just died. Yes. And that of course brings about a time of reflection. What do you think you've taken from their experience? What shaped your life in a big and profound way? I think the, the most positive uh, attribute I've got for my parents is this sense of hard work. I think they worked incredibly hard. My mother came from a very wealthy background prior to coming to Australia and then arrives and she's washing dishes in King's Cross. There's nothing wrong with that life, but it was a very different life to the one that she led as a child. And through hard work and diligence she taught herself, taught herself how to uh, design clothes and ended up with a very successful business and um, designing, making and selling um, high-end fashion. Your dad was sent first to Mount Isa under the was. My father, scheme. You know, my father came, when my, my father arrived, at that, and you weren't allowed to live together as a, as a couple post-Second um, World War, you, when you're on the two-year contract with the Australian government. So my mother was sent to King's Cross to wash dishes, my father was sent to Mount Isa to dig in the mines. A lot of men were sent to the Snowy Mountain scheme. Yes, uh, and he spent his uh, 18 months of the two-year period up there. And then came back, and I think the, the other sort of, you know, you, you, you learn positive and negative things. I mean, your parents can give you uh, behaviours that you learn from in a positive way or a negative way. You either want to try and replicate that or not replicate that. And I think the one thing sad of my father is he gave up. He was a very bright man. Uh, but when you came to Australia uh, from a, a non-English speaking country, none of your degrees were recognised. So, so some of Dad's friends, one was a, a very successful Austrian barrister, one was a nuclear physicist and my father. And the three of them, it's interesting, the, the barrister refused to go and do law again, became a postie and was a postie for the rest of his life. And my father refused to go back to university and became an insurance clerk with the MLC, which was owned, now owned by NAV. Weird. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but my uh, godfather uh, went back and, I mean, it must have been terribly hard for a man with a doctorate and nuclear physics, etc. He went back and did a Bachelor of Science and then did a Masters of Science and then did a PhD and ended up working uh, in, in nuclear physics. So you have this contrasting model of your father mm. 
who, as you say, in a way gave up. Yes. And your mother, who strove very hard to sort of remake herself. I think that, and what I took from that is that you'll be put in situations which may, may not suit you, and it's your choice. Now, some are more difficult than others. My father was incredibly difficult, obviously. But you have a choice of how you're going to approach that situation. And you can strive to try and change, or you can let, let life take you over. You, uh, the family moved to Taramara, yes. north shore of Sydney. Uh, and you say about your schooling that you were the only wog within 50 miles. Yes, yeah, so I was the only. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, it's it's bizarre now when you look in Sydney because there are you know it's kind of cool to be a wog, but um, it, it wasn't cool to be a wog in Taramara in the 1960s. <laughs> it was lit, you know, <laughs> and I think it, it was it was doubly strange or interesting because not only was I about the only wog at Taramara High School within yeah, as far as I could see. But also, the Roma there was no real Romanian community. So it wasn't though we could retreat to a large Greek community or a large Italian community. We were really by ourselves. And it, and it, was, it was strange because I think a lot of my uh, insecurities came from that sort of, I didn't really belong with my Anglo-Saxon friends. And they would remind me on a daily basis that I was a wog. Uh, you know, I, I think they thought it was a nice way. I didn't take it all that well. Uh, and my, I didn't really have that sort of strong, you know, uh, background with a, a community of Romanians that, that many Italians or Greeks would fall back into, and so it was a very uh, difficult childhood in that regard. I didn't, how, I didn't feel I belonged anywhere. How competitive were you? Well, I, I would love to say that I was a great competitive sportsman, but I suck at most <laughs> sports. I try, <laughs> um, but I, I did. I did decide to try and prove I was smarter than most. And not in an arrogant way, just to prove that I could belong. And I, I thought the way I can, I can belong is to prove I'm smart. And so I strove, or was competitive in that regard, to prove I was smart. Well, you had a choice. You wanted to be either a fighter pilot or a doctor. Yes. <laughs> and you're neither, as far as no, I can no. see. It was, it was, it was, <laughs> so yeah, so I, I did quite well at school. Um, Coming up to the last exam, so you had your trial, HSC, as much we have today, and I got uh, 426 in the trial. And this is a different scoring system to now, but 426. And you needed about 405 to 409 to get into medicine. So I thought, okay, that one's home and hose, because uh, you normally would step up. And also I would have applied to the Air Force to do aeronautical engineering and be a fighter pilot. And there were 2,000 applicants, I was down to the last 35, they needed 30. So I thought, I've got two reasonable chances here to pull off one of the two things I really want to do. So I went into the HSC, the, the exam, the, and I was seeing my final three units exam, which was uh, industrial arts or industrial engineering, and I got the university, the, sorry, the university, the school medal for that, and uh, went to the exam, wrote my name on the exam paper and couldn't answer a question. I had a complete breakdown in terms of being able to articulate anything. I literally couldn't read a question. I couldn't answer a question. It was the most horrifying 60 minutes of my life. And I knew that I needed those three units because you needed 10. I only did 10 units. They had to matter. In those days, the exam mark at HSC counted a lot more to your overall mark than it was today. So I left after an hour unable to answer any questions. And that's obviously what happens is then I end up with a 379 HSC, so I couldn't get into medicine. Uh, and I was one of the five who didn't make the cut for the um, Air Force. So it was a really tough time. I remember sitting, oh, my girlfriend broke up with me too. It was a bad January. <laughs> it was a really bad January. It, was a, it sucked. So, so I was sitting on, on my uh, couch, and I was living with my father, and my parents had been divorced. I was sitting on the couch, uh, and within literally a week of each other, I got the HSC result, and therefore I couldn't, and I had my rejection from the Air Force. And I thought, well, I have no plan C. <laughs> and I thought, well, and this is the, I guess, I, I advise my children not to make this decision, but I thought, well, I'll make money. Right. I can't do anything I want to do, I'll go and make money. What will make money? And I thought, computers will make money. This is in 77. So I thought, computers are a place you can make money. So that, I, was, that was right, as it turned out. Well, yeah, it was, yeah, fortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, so, and I did uh, computer science. But that's an unusual thing, um, to be motivated by that thought about money. It's a strange. Do you see money as a means to an end, or what? How I don't know. Happen? I think it's a very interesting because I, I didn't come from a wealthy background, um, middle class, lower middle class, 
Uh, my mother had come from a wealthy background and I think she'd missed that, but she never played that out in front of the children, so we never really saw that. So I don't know, I think it was about security. I think that's where it came. I think I saw my father struggle his whole life and uh, for financial security, never really had financial security. And my mother worked incredibly hard, but also with no security. I think it came from a sense of money will bring security, as opposed to money will bring you a particular... And you just lost your girlfriend, though. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I guess you can buy them now. I guess when you... <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so... So were you a, a well-fitted-out geek, studying computer science? Well, this is... So, no, I, this is the, you know... I'm labelled as this geek. My daughters think I'm a geek because I worked at Microsoft. And all you... children think their parents are geeks. Yeah, well, but I'm a, te a, a real tech nerd. I just I don't actually enjoy technology that much. I was a, I was a terrible computer programmer. <laughs> so I, I it was it wasn't a natural love. It was more like I was good at maths and science. If you're logical and you stick at a problem, you can be good at computers. So it comes the middle '80s, and you're taking jobs. Your first work in the IT business, various firms and you become an applicant for Microsoft. So I decided it was in, in the, uh, so it was 87, 88, I'd been, been working at a company called NEC, which is a large Japanese uh, electronics firm, which also had a very large computer business as well, not so much anymore. And I was the PC product manager, then national marketing manager, and we'd taken the NEC product range to beating IBM. We were the, best, the largest selling PC company in the country, which was quite a feat. It was the only place in the world that it happened. And, but I realised that hardware was a commodity device and that if you really wanted to be at somewhere where you, could, where you could differentiate your product offering, it wasn't going to be in hardware because one PC looks like another PC, not very interesting. You're all marketing on price. But I thought software might be an interesting place to go because there was true differentiation in, in software offerings. So I decided I'm going to go into software. And at that time, there were two jobs going. There was the Lotus, uh, which had Lotus 1, 2, 3, Lotus Notes, that MD's job going, and Microsoft. And I was interviewed for both and, and decided on the Microsoft job. And the, the, as I remember, there were 25 people or something who worked for Microsoft Australia. That's right, at that time, yeah, yeah, yes. So how did Microsoft Australia fit into the global picture? What were you doing? Well, uh, I did a bit of sort of research on software and thought, well, personal computers are, in fact, the future of computing. It's quite clear. And so who were the leading software companies? And it was really Microsoft, Lotus, and WordPerfect were the three. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft had the broadest range of software in terms of operating systems, development tools, and applications. So I thought that made the most sense. And you came up with this concept of bundling them, which seems these days like yeah, it seemed, taken for granted. I know, it's going those to, days it seemed like radical. Yeah, I mean, I, I hold this dear to my heart, but, and you'll, you think oh, this is just so trivial, but uh, bear with me. <laughs> sort of, just sort of nod knowingly and nicely at the right time. Uh, at the time, uh, application software was sold independently. Most people bought a word processor or they bought a spreadsheet. And, and no one really bought databases or, or um, slide applications or presentation applications. Really all the software was these word processes and spreadsheets. And what you found was that um, someone, you know, we were battling Lotus in the spreadsheet world and we were battling WordPerfect in the word processing world. And I came up with this idea, well we had the idea of this thing called Office which had WordPerfect and, sorry, our word, our Microsoft Word and our Excel product together. But no one was buying it because it was effectively two times the price of a single application. So for that single application was $200, it was selling for $400, and no one was buying it. And so Bill Gates came to Australia and uh, on a visit, and we were talking about. It. I said, "Look, I think I think the game here is about dollars per desktop. I don't think it's about selling a, selling a single application. The person who win the software game in." in the PC will be who sells m the most dollars of software. So I think what we should do, Bill, is we should take the office and reprice it down at effectively one and a half times. So if you're the word processing buyer, for a little bit more you get the spreadsheet and something else. If you're the spreadsheet buyer, you get, for a little bit more, you get the word processor. He thought it was a really good idea. Um, the people in Redmond in Microsoft head office hated the idea because we were undermining the brand values, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And so Bill said, well, you know, it's only Australia, you can screw that up, it doesn't really matter the rest of the world. So, seriously, that's what he said. He said, you know, do it here because it won't really matter if it screws up. So we launched it and literally within 90 days we dominated the application space in Australia where Perfect couldn't, couldn't compete because they didn't have a, a spreadsheet now because now the dominant 
product you bought was this thing called Office, which had both, and Lotus was struggling, and so we, we just won both. And then it, about three months later, I went to the US for a trip, and I explained the strategy to the heads of the application groups in the US, who still hated the idea, and Bill told them, you will do this because this is working and that became the dominant product offering of the company. So quite a few things are happening in your life. You joined Microsoft in 88. In 89, Grace, your daughter, is born. Yes. Uh, in 91, you go to the US uh, yes. as, as vice president, not of the United States, but of Microsoft, which is pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Close. And, Close. And you're the first non-American to be put into this sort of a role. Yes. And you left to develop product. Product, you become head of one of the product development yes. divisions. Yes. Uh, which, describe, I mean, I have no real concept of what it was like to work for Microsoft at that level. Well, I mean, at that time, Microsoft was the place to work if you were anything to do with technology around the world. Uh, and really the, the core of the company was its product development units. This is not, not being nasty to the people in the sales operations and marketing, but if you've got a lousy word processor, it doesn't matter how many ads you run, no one's going to buy it. So the core, core of the company was a development organisation, and I was the... I was lucky enough to be the first non-American to run, and there were five product groups where all the products came out of. And so I was one of the five who did that, and it was an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, you know, you were spending time with Bill Gates literally every day, and other people whose names weren't meaning to you, but were luminaries in the in the technology sphere. Meeting with Steve Jobs, meeting with John Scully from Apple, meeting with the guys at IBM. It was a, a wonderful time. I mean, it was, it was sort of, you know, cocaine, you know, <laughs> to, uh, by, by a factor of 10. Not that I've used it, we're by the way. Just, uh, yeah, just, uh, we've just I'm lost our G rating. <laughs> I'm, I'm told. <laughs> but the sense of you, you felt you were at the centre of the universe. You felt you were, in terms of technology and where it was going, you were at the centre of the universe. You were seeing all the new innovations, all the fantastic R&D. And to be an outsider, it was it's kind of a similar theme. I was an outsider again. And, and I wasn't received all that well by many of my American counterparts. And Bill was fantastic. Uh, he tried to get me to go to America twice, and the first time in 1990 I'd said no, because I didn't feel I'd finished my job here, I hadn't proved enough. And then he came back a year later and said, you know, I've got the hardest job in the company for you, you've got to come, and he sort of does the big sort of, you've got to do this for me, and so then I went. And so I felt his support, but it was a very interesting place to, to bring an Australian attitude into a, an American company. What? Huh, it's too tempting to let that one go. What, what, what's the Australian attitude that you want? Well, I, look, I think I, I have a great love of Americans, but they, what an Australian can say in seven words, I'll use 14 paragraphs for. <laughs> and at first, when you first meet them, you think, my gosh, they're incredibly intelligent. And you realise when you parse out what they've said, they haven't said that much. <laughs> and, so, and so I think, you know, by being very, very direct, you only get so much more done. And it was... It was, it was, so it was it's good that we don't generalise in this yeah. class. <laughs> There'll be more to come, Peter. Just go with it. So, so. Well, but, uh, you haven't been there very long. In 91, you go there. In 92, your sister, Gabriella, is killed. And that you've already been affected, as you reflect back on this, mm. by your father and Grace. But this was a profound experience in your life. Look, it was. Uh, my only sibling, two years older than me. Uh, I was never close to her as a child. She was, I was the pretend sportsman trying to be out there. And she was very bookish, very acad academic. Went to Cambridge, did her masters in Arthurian literature. Not many jobs for those people, but uh, it was a, you know, a, a fantastic academic, went to work in government in Canberra, and she had a baby later in life. Um, she had health problems earlier on. And we'd just become close with her new baby, uh, Madeline, who was uh, six months old when she died, when Gabriella died. So it, it, was, it was incredibly heart-wrenching. I'm sure it's always heart-wrenching when you lose a sibling, but for the first time in my 33 years, I was close to my sister. And you know, if there was if there was someone orchestrating the movements of of life, you know, I should be the one taken out, not her. She was the truly good person, and so uh, I found it. I mean, obviously devastating, but but more so, life is not fair. And I think you know you you know that, but you implicitly learn that through that experience. And I also really reflected on how short life was, and I'm. I think I've described it in the past as I was on this mountain and I was very near the top. Bill had just offered me another promotion 
I hadn't taken it up, another promotion. And I came to the conclusion that, no, the view from here is good enough. It's actually okay. This is fine. I don't need to actually continue up that mountain. Now, it didn't mean I wanted to come home and, and go and go and grow strange plants in the north, northern part of New South Wales. I wanted to be relevant, but I didn't need to continue to climb that particular mountain. This is such a departure from what you expect, in a way. You really took the path of this travel. Yes, and, and I naively thought it would be seen as a positive move by many, and, and by many it wasn't. It was seen like given up. People couldn't deal with the shades of grey this introduced. It had to be black or white. You're either full on your career, and everything else takes a second, second footing to that, or you've given up. And I argued that, in fact, no, you can do both. There will be uh, decisions and compromises at the edges, but you can be relevant, you can have, leave a legacy, you can be fulfilled, and you do not have to give up your life for your job. And that was a difficult concept for many people to take. Well, when you come back, and you are significantly motivated by Gabriella's death and, and trying to assist Maddie and David, her father, mm. uh, you, Bill Gates kind of creates a job for you, really, yes. and, and shifts the Asia Pacific headquarters of Microsoft to Sydney, and you make it a much larger organisation than it was. But you stayed there four or five years, but increasingly you're intrigued by the social sciences, and, and you embark on a PhD. <laughs> yeah. This was to have an amusing aspect, amusing to us. Yeah, thank you, yes. For an IT person, yeah. you lost okay. your PhD research now. You better explain. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I said I was coming back to Australia. Bill offered me the, uh, uh, created a job for me to run Asia Pacific and also run an advanced technology research group based out of Australia. So I was very uh, grateful for that. But I started to... I'd start already, you need to go back a bit, when, when before Gabriella died, I'd start experimenting with my group in the US about work hours and, and productivity. I had 500 software developers working for me, a, a range of roles, and I started to change our work habits. No meetings were allowed to start before 9 o'clock. No meetings were allowed to start after 4 o'clock. Um, you know, just sit, you, no meetings were allowed to be held unless there was a decision to be made. I mean, I've got a list of things, that, just to make it, make it productive. And I found two things. I found, one, that uh, it didn't change our productivity. In fact, anything, if anything increased it, we tripled market share and tripled our revenues in a two-year period. And Bill was very pleased with our results. Yet, I, I received this stream of emails from spouses of people who worked for me thanking me for giving them their wife or husband back. And so I thought, well, this is one of the easiest things in the world. We've done nothing to upset the productivity of the organisation, yet we've returned people to their family. So that thread had already existed. Gabriel's death reinforced that. And so I had this going on in my mind that some, there's something wrong with that, the work environment where, where CEOs who stay in the office, who get to the office at six in the morning and leave at three in the morning and haven't seen their children since they were two and are celebrated as being, as being icons. I thought that was just completely wrong. So I started a... a uh, PhD at Macquarie University in, in behavioural sciences, and really the, the hypothesis was that chief executives on a work-life balance scale are more biased towards work than the rest of the people working in the organisation. Now, whether but, it's... But they set the tone for the organisation. Yeah, they, and, and whether it's, you know, is it, is it to gene selection they end up in that role, or is it, is it, is it a more nurtured behavioural cognitive process? I wasn't going to argue how they got to that, but they had this distorted view of reality, if you will. And so I just completed literature review, and... Um, on my laptop and we had a lightning strike at home and uh, it blew up the hard drive and I had no backup. <laughs> and someone from an IT background, uh, who knows, you should back things up. Oh, I, is, is there a moral in this story? Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I took that drive. I had, I had um, I'd paid quite a lot of money for, for members of an American security organisation to try and rebuild the hard drive um, and I couldn't and I, I really could never go back to their PhD. So all I had was the literature review part. That was the only thing I, I had that had been printed. And so I used that to write Father Time, yeah. uh, which is where Father Time came up. I never completed the PhD. And in Father Time, you were talking really about work-life balance. Yes, and, and the role of the father. I think what's often accepted is that the mother is important in the, in the, in the mother-child relationship. That's seen as obvious. What, is, what was seen as less obvious was the role of the father. And this is some time ago now. This is sort of the uh, 96, 97 when I wrote the book. 
And uh, what I found in the literature looking at work-life balance was that there's all this stuff about the role of the father, that, you know, that, that in, in uh, families where the father is, is more prevalent, uh, there are, across any socioeconomic uh, level, so not just for the more wealthy or the less wealthy, there's, you know, uh, the children have less alcohol abuse, less drug abuse, less, less promiscuous sexual relationships, whichever measure you want to use for a dysfunctional life, where a father was not as involved, those children had, had more of those attributes. And so I thought, well, why isn't someone writing about this? This is, this is profound stuff. So I, I you know, recreated that in my, in my book. You stayed working, of course. Yes. You, didn't, you left Microsoft but uh, joined uh, the, the Packer. PBL, yes. PBL, and then uh, more recently Netus. Um, but in 1999, you and Carol set up the foundation. Yes. Um, what was your, how far from the concept is the reality being? What did you have in mind? Well, I think where it came from was uh, when we left Australia and we'd been doing quite well and so we'd met a lot of uh, wealthy people and philanthropy never came up as a discussion in Australia ever, anywhere. And I lo landed in America and every social event you went to, philanthropy was discussed. Every, every, every dinner party, every picnic, and people were talking openly about the causes they supported and why. And, and of course, Bill Gates was always going to be very, very strong on philanthropy. And oh, we had chats on planes for many years, and his mother had instilled in him this, this, this sort of sense that if you are successful, it is your responsibility to give. It's not an issue of choice. You've been given this great life, you have to give back. And it was just drummed into him. So he was always going to be a great philanthropist. But what I noticed was not only the Bill Gateses of the world, but there were some less nice people at Microsoft who were also incredibly philanthropic. And I just sort of, I guess, immersed myself into that world a bit and thought, this is just profound. And read a lot about it and about. And so came back thinking, oh, maybe the world's changed in Australia in the few years I've been away. And of course, nothing had changed. And so we start, I thought, well, we'll start by, by, by creating our own foundation uh, to try and invest in things that we think are meaningful. And that was more causes. So in the early days, we, um, in fact, have still got quite a strong thread in medical research. Um, Garvin, great, Garvin, we've got a, a chair in Hospital. Westmead Hospital, pediatric chair in neurology at Westmead Children's and a chair in breast cancer at the Garvin. And we've done a couple of other things. We're doing another chair uh, soon. But it, the other part which we started to invest in was in research into giving and trying to look at giving patterns in Australia for our high net worth, our wealthy, compared to that in Canada, the UK and the US. And just outline what you found, because it's pretty disturbing. On any metric, by any measure, whichever data source you use, Australian, the Australian wealthy are the most greedy and lacking in philanthropy of all the wealthy anywhere around the world by orders of magnitude. And that's not an overstatement. That's a subtle way of introducing the concept. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is appalling. By some measures, our most wealthy are giving about one fifteenth. And when you say wealthy, you're talking about people with incomes, 100,000. Or, net, net, or, no, or net wealth over 10 million. Right. So, so not an income basis, on an asset basis. Right. Uh, and you, when you calibrate, you know, people say, oh, it's your tax rates. And when you calibrate for all of that, you still get to the sad reality that our most wealthy do not feel a strong responsibility to give back to the community in which they've generated their wealth. I know uh, a lot of people have seen the book by Sunstein and Thaler called Nudge, and, and Nudge, you've read Nudge, uh, and Nudge is really about choice architecture, yes. which suggests that if the way you set up a choice actually yes. greatly influences the behaviour. Uh, with your interest in behavioural science. Um, how do you nudge the wealthy to actually see things differently and start to give? So I think there's this, the argument of carrots and sticks in any, in any uh, choice architecture or behavioural modification. I think the work that uh, David Gonski has done in the prime movement in this country for tax changes to support giving have provided an, an, an enormous number of carrots it is very, very, very easy to give now in Australia. But what we don't have is, the, is the, either the social pressure or the tax pressure to give. Now, if you look in, in the UK, in Canada, and the US, particularly in the US in terms of social pressure, but increasingly now in the UK, you know, 
you go to dinner parties, as I mentioned, and people talk about giving. If you can't talk about your giving, you're a social pariah. So there is, a, there is quite a lot of social pressure to do something, even if you don't want to. Equally, because of the existence of estate taxes, there is this sort of Damocles sword hanging over you. If you don't give, they'll take it away from you at the end. And I know it's a difficult concept to discuss in Australia, and people want to avoid it, but the harsh reality is that the existence of an estate tax does motivate giving by the wealthy. And in countries where there is an estate tax, there's high levels of giving by the wealthy. In countries where there isn't an estate tax, there are low levels of giving. So, not this surprisingly, would be amongst, amongst the, the wealthy people, this would be. This goes down super well. <laughs> <laughs> this would be much worse than a carbon tax idea. Well, it, it, and look, it's really interesting. It, it's, it's really interesting. So, the model I've proposed, I'll only just I'll describe just to. It's not, it's not that bad. What I've suggested is that for wealth over $20 million, then the state tax of 20% exists. And that estate tax is applied only if you haven't allocated 20% of your estate to philanthropy. And if you decide not to, to, in fact, allocate that to philanthropy, that money doesn't go to general revenue, it goes to an Australian philanthropy fund, arm's length run, like the future fund sort of model. So the money ends up going to philanthropic causes. And so the argument I've used with me and my very wealthy friends is, you know, take a billionaire on a billion dollars, can that person live just as a happier life, buy as many third world nations as they want, um, with $800 million as opposed to a billion dollars? Will it really change their lifestyle? Now we know it's someone at the low end, so $20 million a, a, a state or a net assets, if you have 16, not 20, will your life be fundamentally changed? Will you lack the choice architecture to do anything you want? No, you won't. Nothing will change. So if we know that it won't change there and it won't change there, then everybody else, it won't change their life. And so the, the argument that I receive back is, oh, you know, it's not fair, it's going to change my life. It won't. The maths prove it won't. And yet the amount of money that would pour into the philanthropic se uh, sector is extraordinary. It would be changing. What have you learned over the last 11, and 11 years about how to channel the funds you put aside for the foundation? Yeah. yeah you've, got up, you've been contributing 600000 a year to that. Oh, uh, in some years more, yes. And so one thing I learned from, uh, from Bill, I uh, learned a lot of things. One of the things was don't just throw your money into, into philanthropic causes. Apply the same intellect and the same energy and the same sort of uh, rigour to giving as you do to your normal job. And that, I think you see that now with what Gates is doing with his foundation. And of course ours is a tad smaller. But I used, so uh, the first interest was in the area of breast cancer. And so I thought, well, uh, my, my wife's mother died of breast cancer, my wife's mother's sister died of breast cancer, we've got three daughters, so it's not quite self-serving, but it's definitely close to home. And I thought, well, I want to fund some breast cancer research. I want to find who's worth funding. And so I started on this journey of discovery. By the way, it was very hard to find, to get the data, which I finally got, to find out who's, who's worthy of funding. And what I found was that there is a, a reasonable amount of breast cancer research in this country which is not worth funding. It shouldn't be given any oxygen at all. It is not moving the dial at all in terms of breast cancer research. It's just people throwing money at it because it, the person is articulate or they come from a great institution or it feels good. But I found one person who was regarded around the world as one of the top 20 breast cancer researchers who happened to be at the Garvin, Professor Rob Sutherland, and so we funded him. But it was a very interesting journey through what I, I thought in a scientific field everything would be dealt with with rigour including the funding side, and I found that wasn't the case. Just a final question. You've also generously given to the Centre for Social Impact. What potential do you see in the concept of such a centre? Uh, this will get me in a bit of trouble, but hey, I've been there so already tonight. I, when we first started working in the sector in terms of funding research, I, I found to my, um, to my great sadness that the quality of intellectual rigour being applied to this sector, to the third, third sector, if you will, was not the same as I'd seen in other sectors, in, in finance and banking, in technology, in medical research. There really was a, and there's not a comment on the people involved, but just the rigour and the intellectual processes applied, I thought, well, that wasn't good enough. 
We needed to have an institution in this country that was doing world-class research and delivering world-class programs in, for the third sector and as, the, as those courses were taken by people from other areas. And so it was that motivation and then, you know, very fortunate to have Peter Shugol appointed to the role and that, that sort of, I guess, put a, a lovely frosting on, the, on it that someone of his calibre would be involved with, this, with the centre. And it was really that goal of we're going to have a centre which will be world-class in terms of the research it undertakes and the, and the programs it delivers. I think that's the case. It's great having the conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.